Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Carlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and welcome to the Figure It Out cast for October 2019. Uh, I'm your host here, Adam Korlick, and as always, what we're going to be doing here is talking about a whole host of different subjects. Now, this is a Patreon-backed podcast, so I once I very much want to thank all the Patreon backers. If you are one, you get early access to this as well as all of, or almost all of my videos over there, uh, so I really appreciate that. And uh, if you're just listening to this publicly, I appreciate that as well. It comes out a couple weeks after uh, the initial recording for those who are brand new to this. Um, now, what we're going to do, talk about a whole bunch of different subjects I have laid out. They are in the description, and there is time code uh, associated with them, so if at any time you want to skip around, you feel free to do so. But otherwise, just sit back, relax, and enjoy the podcast. Now, our first subject today is going to be kind of a uh, an unfortunate one, but uh, we're going to talk about it. Uh, John Kirby, uh, video game uh, legend to an extent, uh, passed away. Now, if you're not familiar with John Kirby, uh, his his big um, contribution to the gaming industry is he was a lawyer for Nintendo in the 80s, and uh, the case that he handled most infamously was Nintendo v. Universal, which was basically a lawsuit about Donkey Kong, and Universal claiming that Donkey Kong uh, was a derivative work of King Kong and therefore infringed upon the rights of Universal Studios. Um, John Kirby successfully argued this in court and ultimately prevailed, hence we have Donkey Kong at all today. Uh, he would not be around if they had lost that case, and who knows what else might have come of that, because that could have been very devastating for Nintendo as a corporation. Um, now, ultimately, in, in an effort to honor him back then, that's actually where the Kirby character gets his name from, is John Kirby. Uh, so that's that's his big contribution to the video game industry, and that's that's pretty influential. I mean, that's a lot more, even though he was always kind of an under-the-radar type of dude, because he was, he was just a lawyer, basically, um, that is a, a pretty substantial amount of impact that one can have, because because of him... You essentially have two characters. You have Donkey Kong and all the characters associated with Donkey Kong, and you have Kirby. <laughs> Both not necessarily intentionally, he did not create either one, but one survived because of him, and one was essentially generated because of him, or at least the name was. And the um, I guess they described, I've heard that some aspects of his personality were put into Kirby as well, so... That's kind of a cool way to honor the guy while he was still alive. But anyway, so he has passed. Uh, I believe he had something to do with the Game Genie lawsuit as well, but I, I, I don't. That, that was one where they didn't ultimately win. But unfortunately, I'm not entirely certain. Um, for a, a little bit there, I, I misunderstood. I thought he was also. I confused him briefly with Howard Lincoln, the guy who ultimately went on to argue against the ESRB about Night Trap and all that stuff. But that wasn't him. That was John Kirby. Is like I said, primarily known for his Nintendo versus Universal lawsuit. So rest in peace, John Kirby. And everybody, continue to, the next time you play anything with Donkey Kong in it or with Kirby in it, just remember, this dude made that happen one way or another. So, R.I.P. John Kirby. Now, uh, the next subject we have here is kind of an interesting one. Apparently this happened, not that, this happened back in like March of this year, but it didn't really get much attention until recently. Uh, so there was a lost prototype found of a Star Wars game for Sega Saturn. Now, here's my understanding of the situation, and I'll just kind of uh, brief it, because the Sega Saturn Junkyard, or the Saturn Junkyard, did an incredible video about this if you want more information. But basically, uh, in the mid-90s, uh, there was a Star Wars game being developed um, by, I believe it was actually Sega, not necessarily LucasArts, or at least Sega had commissioned two, because they had two games in the works. Uh, one was a uh, Star Wars arcade reproduction for the Sega Saturn, probably very similar to the 32X game that we got. And then there was this, a unique game made wholly for the Sega Saturn. Uh, now, both projects never came into existence. In fact, the Sega Saturn actually has no Star Wars games on it. Fun fact, neither does the Sega Genesis. The 32X does and the Sega CD do, but for some reason the Genesis doesn't and the Saturn doesn't. Uh, it wouldn't be until the Dreamcast where you'd see another Star Wars game show up on Sega hardware. So anyway... Uh, this game was in development at one point. It was announced in, you know, a couple of publications, and it was called Star Wars Rebel Strike. Ultimately, that name went on to be used in a GameCube game, the um, the third in the uh, Rogue Squadron series. Um, there's probably no connection there. I mean, Rebel Strike is just a good name for a Star Wars game. Now, the demo, or not demo, the prototype of this surfaced uh, a few months ago, and it looked very limited, and there was no real information on it. But just recently, the prototype was actually leaked. Anybody can go ahead and download it and check it out. Now, I have not tried it myself. I, I really just watched uh, a couple of videos about it. 
And the way it's described is that it plays pretty well for a little bit. You know, it's it seems like a lot of effort was put into the beginning of the game, and you're you're basically riding around on one of those. Um, I forget the name, and I'm I'm gonna lose some Star Wars credibility here. But um, those not pod racers, but like the little motorcycle type of things they use in Return of the Jedi. You're basically riding on one of those, the the floating ones, the hover ones, the hover bikes. Sure, let's go with that. Um, you're basically riding on one of those and using it to attack, you know, enemies and stuff like that. Uh, and it's really only got like one playable level. And the further you get into the level, the less and less content there is because it, it would seem that that's as far as they got, at least in that particular build of the game. Um, but that part of it at least is extraordinarily playable and there's no real way to conclude it. But, uh, why it was ultimately canceled remains unknown. Uh, and it would be very fascinating to see what that game could have been because, I, I think the Saturn could have sorely used a, a good Star Wars game. I mean, I like the Saturn, but it, it, it is missing a lot of content, and that has to do with a lot of history behind the Saturn and the behind the scenes of it and how it was just horribly mistreated in North America and Europe. Um, it's it's kind of cruel, actually. You know, uh, While I was never super into the Saturn, I do recognize why it would be frustrating to someone who really is, because especially in Japan, where it actually was successful, there's so much content produced over there that never came out here even stuff that would surprise you like um this is kind of a side note but like there's games like a fighting game called rabbit made by ea that only came out in japan ea of all people um and uh for some reason games like that just never came out here and it it must be frustrating if you're into the saturn knowing that there's like this whole plethora of tapped untapped games in japan that one could bring over and do translations of and some efforts have been you know existed to do that um but to know that there was also games like this which could have potentially moved a lot of units i mean at that point in time star wars was just kind of starting to come back with the 97 re-releases and having some video games tied in that weren't necessarily as limited as things like a star wars arcade on 32x and stuff like that had been or the star wars you know chess game they had on sega cd it's like that whole era there really wasn't a good star wars game on sega hardware until the dreamcast so who knows maybe this one could have been good um based on the prototype i mean you have to treat it as a prototype it's a completely unfinished game but uh, based on that premise alone, it seems like it could have been a lot of fun. But, you know, who really knows? But uh, if you want to check it out, again, just you can just basically do a Google search. I mean, there are links to this. It's Nobody seems to care. Um, how it got out, I'm not entirely certain. But it's just one of those things that goes to show you, like, there has to be so much random treasure in the world like that that's just sitting in places that nobody really thinks of and you know somebody unearths it and it's like oh does anybody care about this and then yeah turns out there's people that care about this but um you know there you go if you have a saturn you can check that out make sure of course you have to have a saturn that's either capable of reading uh burned games or you have to have you know one of those flash cards that allows it to do so it's not going to work just natively but if you're super into the saturn you probably already know how to do that so yeah now Moving on. Speaking of prototypes and random treasure that can be randomly found and possibly sold, uh, we're going to be talking today about the Nintendo PlayStation prototype and how it might be sold soon. So I'm going to give you a little backstory here in case you're not familiar, because there's always there are always people that have wait, what did you just say? Nintendo PlayStation. Um, this I've done whole videos on this, but the super short version is uh, in the early '90s, Sony and Nintendo got together to make uh, a new home console that would would have been called the PlayStation. Now, the deal ultimately fell apart because they couldn't agree on certain issues. Again, I, I made whole videos about this. But really what came of it was Nintendo abandoned the concept of CDs, hence they went forward with the Nintendo 64. Sony decided to create their own hardware called the PlayStation, as we all know it today. Uh, Philips got a really weird deal where they were allowed to make some Nintendo games on their Philips CDI. So that's why you got the Zelda Unholy Triforce and you got the... Um, uh, Mario Hotel game, or Hotel Mario. And Sega just got a bunch of games developed by Sony for Sega CD. That's really what kind of came of all that. But one other thing that came of it was an actual prototype piece of hardware. Now, as far as I understand it, four pieces of this hardware were ever produced. And they were really just Super Nintendos with a completely different shell and they had a functional disk drive. And the disk drive was capable of reading music CDs, but it also could read its own game format. That game format is actually what caused most of the uh, economic deals that, or economic problems that caused the whole thing to break down. So 
after the whole thing fell apart, uh, Sony corporate ordered all prototypes to be destroyed. Three of the four were destroyed. One of them ended up in the first president of Sony Computer Entertainment, uh, Olaf Olafson or something like that. I'm sorry, I don't remember his exact name. That guy ended up with it. And he just basically lied and claimed that the thing had been destroyed. And nobody, nobody cared. It, nothing happened with it. Now, what he did with it is he kept it in his office for years, just, just as a display piece. And at some point, there was an estate sale. During that estate sale, uh, my buddy Terry Diebold, uh, the guy who currently owns the Nintendo PlayStation prototype, went to said estate sale. Now, as I understand it from what he's told me, he, he didn't go there with any intention of buying anything video game related. He, doesn't, he didn't really know anything about video games that wasn't his interest. He went to this thing just kind of looking for anything that would be of interest to him. And he, he went in there into this estate sale with a whole bunch of other people and saw a box. Now, in the top of the box, as I recall him saying, it had, like, forks and knives and cutlery and stuff. And that's actually kind of what he wanted. He was like, oh, I could use some silverware. So he bought this box. He just bid on it, kind of Storage Wars style, you know, where you're not allowed to touch anything. You can just kind of see something, and based on what it is, you have to just gamble. So he bid something like $70 on it. And uh, he ends up winning this box. And he gets the silverware that he wanted. And at the bottom, there's this Nintendo PlayStation prototype. Again, the dude's not into video games. He doesn't really think much of it. He doesn't, he's, just, he's like, okay, whatever. He doesn't throw it away because he doesn't know what it is, but he just decides, okay, I don't know what this is. And he just puts it in a box, keeps it in the box, and then puts it in his garage for years. Um, now, from what he's told me, his son at some point uh, was looking up videos for whatever reason, and he came across a few different videos. He did actually say mine was one of them, along with a few other YouTubers. And they had all been showing this, the pictures of the prototype back from the early 90s from the few stock photos we ever had. And he was just claiming, like, his son basically was like, oh, we have that thing. He just went public with it. He's like, yeah, we have that. And everybody thought he was a liar and none of that was true. And then they ended up proving it. They're like, no, here it is. They, they took it out of a box and then they started telling the Internet their story about how they got it. And it kind of set off a, an interesting career for him. He got to be able to go to travel around, to go to all these conventions and show the world the Super Nintendo or the Nintendo PlayStation prototype. Now, Terry is a friend of mine. I've seen the Nintendo PlayStation prototype multiple times at different conventions. I've safeguarded it. I've I've even touched it on my face. Like <laughs> I've done after I've held it. You know, it's just it's a cool random piece of obscure history, and it's really cool that Terry's been kind of treating it like a traveling museum. Um. But, you know, uh, the time has, I guess, kind of come for that to, to, to change. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of Terry's personal life because it's not my place to do so. But uh, it is uh, he has been talking for quite some time about being willing to sell it. Um, and I know that there's going to be people that come out and be like, it should be in a museum. And it, you know, you're greedy. You just want it for money. You bought it for not that much. And it's like, yes, but it's hard to, that's not really a fair argument because it doesn't really understand Terry's personal situation. Uh, without getting into too much detail, you have to understand Terry is a, um, uh, a war vet and, you know, he doesn't have much in the way of those types of options, uh, at his age. So I've always kind of likened him to a little bit like, uh, Rose DeWitpicator and, or DeWitpicator, I forget how you pronounce it, but the, you know, uh, Titanic. Uh, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, <laughs> Kate Winslet's character in Titanic. Uh, you know, at the end of the movie, she's super poor. She has nothing. She has no connections. She's got nobody. But then she has that diamond that's like the most valuable thing in the world. But she's completely unable to sell it because it's too valuable, too rare, too unique. And it's just like you, the, the hardest part about being so poor is being so rich. And that's kind of the same problem that Terry's kind of come into. He's He's... Basically, you know, he doesn't have much, but he has this thing. And he's kind of at that point where, like, he has no choice but to break up with it, even though he doesn't want to. And he's told me how much he's seeking. Um, and at first, the number, I'm not going to say it because it's not my place to do so. But the number can be off-putting because you're like, dude, you bought it for $70. What you're asking for is completely unreasonable. But when you understand all the details of it, and I would happily talk about this if I had his consent to do so, but I do not, and therefore I will not. Uh, once you break down his situation and understand him more, you'll realize the number he's asking is actually extremely reasonable considering what he has to do with the money. I'll put it that way. And I wish him the best. If anything, given the math that I've done, uh, he probably should be asking more than he is. 
um, but I, I'm not really allowed to elaborate. So I do know that uh, if you you know if you ever met Terry and you ever got to see the Nintendo PlayStation prototype, you probably were able to play it. You were probably able to enjoy it. Uh, he was always very cool about that. Um, I personally, I mean, I have no impact on the situation, but if I could, if I could find some sort of museum that would be willing to offer him what he's, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say what he wants. I'm going to say what he needs for this thing. I think that would be a fantastic thing to do, but I, I don't know. I just, I don't, I, it's such a strange item that I don't know how you manage to get a museum to bid that much for it. I don't know how you get that many individuals to bid that much for it. It kind of reminds me of, I mean, you know, there's not a whole lot of basketball fans watching, but I'm from Chicago, right? So Michael Jordan, he's like a god here. Um, his house that he built in the 90s when he was still playing here, he still owns that house, even though he hasn't lived here for like 15 years. And you wonder why, because he's been trying to sell it all that time. The problem with something like that is that it's such an expensive, unique item. Like Michael Jordan's house was built around his tastes. It has multiple gyms and pools and the number 23 everywhere. And then the amount of money that one would have to put down for that house is astronomical. And there's just only a handful of people in the world that could possibly do it. And there's just not enough people who would be interested in it. And that's kind of the same problem you run into with the, this thing. It's so rare and so unique and so expensive. You just go... We'd all love to have it, but nobody can really afford it. Um, so we'll see. I wish him the best, but my the sad truth is I think anyone who is likely to have the money for this thing and be willing to buy it is probably going to be the kind of super collector that's going to keep it in a vault somewhere. Um, and some of them are, let's just say, not American Um which should be most of the world, of course. But one of them, the one he's told me is like, oh man, I mean, I get why you would do it financially speaking, but it would suck if it had to go there. I personally would love to see some major video game museum or some sort of technology museum uh, put up a bid for this thing um, and have it be public that way. You know, a competent bid, not, not like, oh, we'll give you a tax write-off or anything like that. Like, you know, like a real, you know, bid. Um, that way the world can enjoy it forever publicly, but, um, you know, who knows, who knows? Uh, but we'll see, we will see. But however, uh, it is not, it's not done yet. He hasn't actually sold it. That, that person hasn't come forward more or less. It's just been kind of an advertisement as of late that he's more willing to sell it. He's been talking about selling it for quite some time, but I think now it's becoming much more real. Um, so, uh, I'm happy to announce today in my next subject here, kind of combining the two, uh, first of all, PRGE, Portland Retro Game Expo 2019. I will be at Portland Retro Game Expo, uh, just kind of wandering around as kind of an informal guest, uh, with all that kind of stuff covered, although I'm not really being advertised as being there, but I will be there. I don't have any panels or anything. I'm just kind of chilling. Um, I will be there and so will the Nintendo PlayStation prototype. If you have not seen it, this could be possibly your final chance to do so. Um, it will be there publicly with Terry, um, as it usually is for stuff like that. But I talked to him literally today, and he, while he knows he'll be there for that, this could be the end. This could be the final time it's ever publicly displayed. I mean, again, we don't know where it's going to end up, but it's possible. So if you have a chance, if you've never seen it and you've always wanted to you know, put up or shut up time. It's basically where it is now. So unfortunately, the majority of you will have heard this podcast after PRGE, which I apologize for. But yeah, well, hopefully it went well. That's that's really all I can say about that. But um, yeah, PRGE, uh, for those of you who are Patreon backers, now you see why you're getting this stuff early is <laughs> somewhat helpful. Anyway, uh, so yes, that's the couple of stories there. Um, next up, though, in regards to... Uh, oh, I want to continue on PRGE, though, just for a second. Portland Retro Game Expo, I've only been once. I went there last year, and I got to say, that is the definitive convention for retro gaming. Um, I've been to a lot of them across the country, across the world, actually, in different countries as well. And I've never seen one that can compete with PRGE. It is by far the biggest, and that includes a lot of the ones that people people would know, um, you know, including Too Many Games. Too Many Games is probably the second biggest one. I can't, the only one I can think of that's bigger or more impressive is PRGE. Um, 
But uh, if you've ever been to too many games, then you've basically been to diet PRGE. And that's the best way I can put it. Um, but nothing else I've ever been to is even within that conversation as far as scale. Uh, and as far as unique items and, you know, collected uh, guests and everything like PRGE just has figured it out and they're just, they really are on top of their shit. So good for them. Um, but yeah, that in a, in a way it's kind of appropriate that that could potentially be the last place that the public ever gets access to the Nintendo PlayStation prototype. So there you go. Now, next subject, moving on, speaking of conventions and things of that nature, uh, there is a small convention coming up in Kyoto, Japan, uh, called Magic Kyoto. This is uh, the same group uh, by Cedric Biscay who does Magic Monaco. I've never been to Magic Monaco, but I've heard a lot of good things. Um, this is Cedric Biscay is one of the producers of uh, Shenmue 3, and he runs this basically like convention in Monaco with free tickets, and now in Kyoto with free tickets. This will be, as far as I know, the last major press event for Shenmue 3 before its release. Um, now I realize I don't really have that many fans who live in Japan and the ones who do are my fellow Gaijin who are just kind of over there for one reason or another, but, uh, I expect fully to be at Magic Kyoto. Um, so if you are going, I will be there. Um, I'm also trying to orchestrate a little bit of a surprise through that, but I can't talk about it yet. Um, so, but by the time... Actually, at the time this comes out publicly, I still will not have been there yet. So we'll, yeah, I can't talk about it yet. But um, Magic Kyoto, if you, it's, you know, it, it, we'll talk more about Japan in a second. But uh, if you wanted some sort of excuse to go to Japan beyond what you already probably desire to do, and you're looking for a little convention type of thing, Magic Kyoto, that could be a pretty cool one. Um, at the moment, the tickets for that are actually free, like I said before. So you, all you have to do is just kind of book them online and boom, you're good. Um, there's nothing special about it. You don't need any you know, special connections or anything. Um, just to get tickets, I mean. But uh, And if you were going to go to Kyoto, uh, I would recommend landing in Osaka, Kansai, and then taking a train from there up to Kyoto. It only takes about an hour. Um, but yeah, that's just a suggestion in case anybody's interested in that. And we'll leave it at that for now. Next up, though, speaking of Shenmue, because I'm that guy who always has to talk about it, uh, Shenmue 3 uh, is right around the corner, both for early access at this point, for people who are listening to this on Patreon, and people uh, publicly. We are within the final span here. Uh, Shenmue 3 is soon going to be real. Obviously, the Shenmue 3 demo has finally come out. Uh, which was fantastic. Um, I actually gave my key away for that because one, I don't play on PC anyway, but two, I'd, I've played it before, you know, at different events and so on and so forth. So I wanted more people to enjoy it. Um, but I hope a lot of you guys got to check it out and have been enjoying that demo. And I, one thing that makes me really happy is reading reactions from people who have been playing it and not just Shenmue fans, like, you know, outlets, news outlets, all that kind of stuff. Because there's this, there's been this concern for years surrounding Shenmue 3, like, oh, this was a Kickstarter game, so it's going to suck because of things like Mighty Number no. 9 and, um, to a lesser extent, uh, you know, things like Ukulele and all that stuff. All these projects that came into existence and just kind of let everybody down. It seems like Shenmue 3 isn't letting people down. And that's how I felt about it when I played it. It was like, if you liked Shenmue for what it always, always was, Shenmue 3 will be right up your alley. It's that plus more. But if you never liked Shenmue in the first place, then it's not for you. It's not holding your hand and trying to say, okay, fine, we'll give Ryo a gun and we'll let him break into cars. Like They didn't try to change up what the game is. And I appreciate that. So the fact that so many people have embraced it and are really enjoying it makes me really happy because especially when the fans too are also really happy with it based on the demo. It's just a fantastic thing. So I'm super happy about that. Uh, but because the fans are, are rabid, <laughs> and I know I'm one of them. Um, one cool thing that's, that's come out is people are already hacking the crap out of that demo. Um, and the, one of the coolest things is that the entire score to the game, I guess, is in the demo. And people have already released the entire score, so you can like download all the music and listen to that in, like, I guess, preparation. Um, and it's, it's fascinating because I, I know the music was a combination of things. A lot of new music was created for the game for specific moments, but a lot of the music is also, uh, stuff from the previous games. 
And a lot of it's also unused tracks because I always try to tell people this, like, you know, you, you listen to all the music in Shenmue 1 and 2 and you're like, there's so many different pieces of music written for these games. It's insane. And it's like, you don't even have, you have no idea. Uh, they wrote a ton of music back in the late 90s, early aughts for Shenmue. And only 20% of it was ever used for the first two games, which, and Sega gave uh, Yu Suzuki and EaseNet or YSNet full access to the remaining archives of music. So they actually have tons of music to pull from. And that's, you'll notice it because there's a lot of stuff that's very similar, but there's a lot of stuff that's very new and a lot of stuff that's very recycled in a good way. Um, so it's, it's just, it's all coming together, guys. It's all coming together. I'm super excited about it. I can't wait to pl- wait to play the final game. Um, I'm in a fantasy world. Here's what I'm hoping to do. Uh, I'll be in Kyoto for that event. Uh, then I want to come back to Chicago and just kind of shut down for a little while and just play one and two right before three comes out, if possible. Um, I don't know if my schedule will allow me to do that. Um, I, I actually, I'm, I don't even know if my schedule will allow me to play Shenmue three when it comes out. How de- how depressing is that? But if possible, that's that's what I want to do. And then I'll just go offline for days and days and just enjoy myself playing that. But we will see. We will see. Uh, I'm hoping, can you guys tell me what you think? Because by the time this comes out publicly, we will only be a couple weeks away from the game. And I'm just curious who's excited, who's interested. And I, I fully recognize that not everybody is a big Shenmue fan. And I appreciate you guys so much. Not only those who are already fans or those who decided to become fans partially through my channel, whatever it is. But to those of you especially who never had an interest in it and still don't, but listen to this anyway and support the channel regardless... You guys are the true heroes. Seriously, (laughs) I appreciate you and your patience. You guys are the best. Now, moving on. Speaking of people who are the best, it is time for some shout-outs. All of the following people are Patreon backers. Every single one of them is at the appropriate level in which they get a shout-out. Now, at any time, if you wish to, you can join the Patreon. You can help support this channel. You can keep everything going, which I really do appreciate, because I'm not going to lie, that's getting a lot harder. Um, But still... I appreciate you guys so much, uh, and for I think it's $5 a month, you get early access to videos and all that kind of stuff, and these guys, uh, for what they're doing, they get shoutouts plus that, and there, you can check out the Patreon, there's always a link in the description of all the videos, and you can see whatever you want to see, uh, and see all the perks and all that kind of stuff, but shoutouts, first up, Corey Marsh, Jesse Perez, Joseph Tamburino, Luis Bonilla, Michael Kelly, Eric Perales, and Trey Wagner. Once again, that's Corey Marsh, Jesse Perez, Joseph Tamburino, Luis Bonilla, Michael Kelly, Eric Perales, and Trey Wagner. Thank you guys so much for helping to keep the lights on. I really do appreciate it. You guys are the best. Moving on, though. This is a small subject because of how big of a subject it actually was. Um, I did a video uh, that I think will be public by the time both... Definitely by the time this podcast is public, but also by the time that... Uh, this podcast is available to Patreon backers. It'll be available to everybody. Um, I did a video about Japanese travel tips. Um, now, I have no idea what the reaction to that video is yet. I, I know that that video was requested for a long time. A lot of people have been asking for the last couple of years, like, I want to go to Japan. What do I do? Because I've been there a bunch of times now, and I've picked up a lot of stuff. So I ended up making a 97-minute video full of advice. And... You know, I, I, there were people I was talking to about this that said maybe that was excessive and maybe I should have done it shorter, which, you know, maybe probably true. But I just didn't want to be, I didn't want to make a video where I went like, top 10 things you need to do in Japan. Like, I, I, I really don't respect videos like that. Um, what I wanted to do was make a kind of an off the cuff video, just two people chatting. You know, me, well, me chatting and you being the other person, the listener kind of just absorbing whatever it is we have to talk about and of course you're free to chat with me in the comments and if you have any other further questions i'd be happy to answer them um i the only reason i'm kind of making this i guess half apology is i know it was long and i do take full responsibility for the fact that the structure of that video is kind of all over the place and i'm sorry for that um but hopefully anybody who's interested in going to japan will get some use out of it um, it was very comprehensive, obviously 97 minutes worth of content. Like it's, there's a lot in there. That's just like, you should try this. You should do that, blah, blah, blah. So if you ever have just a lot of time on your hands and you're genuinely curious about it, go ahead and make yourself a little food, get yourself a coffee a beer, whatever you like, and just sit down, relax and enjoy the video and just kind of be like, okay, that's a good point. Oh, we should try that. Write down your favorite notes, whatever you want. And hopefully it will help you if you do any sort of trip, 
uh, to Japan, including possibly Magic Kyoto, which, again, I will be there most likely. So I hope to see some of you guys there. Next subject. Uh, all right. So this one, I, I'm only going to preface this subject because I want to know really if you guys want me to elaborate on it. So last night at the time I record this, I was kind of standing in one of, in my um, office here and I have a bunch of video games in my office. It's the door you guys see behind me in all my videos. There's a door there, right? Inside, that's my office. Now, there's a ton of video games in here. And I was just looking around at some parts of the collection. And I just started thinking by looking at certain stuff. I was like, that console, you know, like, and I won't give any specific examples. But I'm like, that console, you know, that one I want every game for. And that one, I don't. That one, I want some of the games for. That one, you know what I mean? Like, they were different, like, mental rules for myself and i just started thinking about like why that is you know like why why is it that i want every game i can possibly find for this one why is it for this console i want every single one no exceptions why is it for this one that i want just some why is it this for this one i don't want any you know what i mean like it's all over the place and i kind of thought about possibly doing a video entirely on this subject about bringing up some consoles, putting them on the table, and we just sit there and chat about, like, my personal tastes in collecting and why I do what I do with it. Um, this is actually a, a project I was kicking around for a number of years. There was a phase there, like, five years ago. Um, I was meeting up with various collectors uh, throughout the world, just kind of randomly, and I would interview them. And, you know, they would show me their collections and I would be like asking them that same basic question. Problem is the video really never went anywhere and I never really had a structure to assemble it. And now I still have the footage, but unfortunately the audio is really bad and like it's out of date. And a lot of those people don't even have their collections anymore. So it's like things have really changed. It was like this half attempt at making some sort of documentary that I was thinking about. But I'm wondering if maybe I actually go through with that video and just kind of do the best I can with it. Like make my portion of it and then just kind of incorporate some of that footage and just kind of give the the warning that the audio is not good and things like that you guys tell me though like you have a vote in this and that's that's actually why i'm bringing it to your attention like would you like to see that or would you want to just hear my opinions on it like what do you think or do you not care i'm, I'm legitimately asking for feedback here because i'm curious what everyone would think about that so we can talk about that again in the future if you guys want to otherwise i guess we'll never revisit it so moving on this is just kind of a, a funny subject, just a little weird one. Um, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you guys heard about this. Uh, a guy uh, hacked a McDonald's PC and got it to run Doom. And I say hacked very loosely because it's not really much of a hack. So uh, McDonald's still, for their uh, ordering systems, they still actually use Windows XP. Um, which I find to not be that strange. A lot of a lot of companies where they have like a lot of public interaction or a lot of touch button based interaction for stuff like that, like grocery stores with those self checkouts, a lot of those actually use Windows XP for some reason. Um, and I assume I assume there is a reason. I doubt it's just because they're out of date. I think there's probably an actual reason behind it. Maybe easier to run unsigned code or or I don't exactly know what it is, but. Either way, they, they do tend to do that. Anyway, so this dude uh, got access to one, and he loaded up Doom on it. He actually got it to run successfully through that, which just kind of added to that joke about, you know, it's it's good when it can run Doom. Um, and there's really no follow-up to this. I just thought this was kind of creative, and it was just kind of interesting to just kind of further add to that old joke. So there you go. Doom uh, is now running on a McDonald's cash register. Oh, and this is something, speaking of McDonald's, though, um, one thing I found really weird is, you know, they, Disney's doing that live action Mulan, right? Where they did it. And yet McDonald's never did a re-release of the, uh, Mulan Szechuan sauce from the Rick and Morty infamous now <laughs> Mulan Szechuan sauce. It's kind of funny that they re-released it for that, but not ultimately for the actual movie. I wonder, I wonder why, but either way, whatever it was a thing. Uh, moving on next story. So this one is just kind of strange, but kind of fascinating. Uh, there's an upcoming mission called JUICE, aka the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer mission that's going to be launched by the ESA, the European Space Agency, and Airbus. 
Uh, and they're doing this mission where the, I think they launch in like 2021 and it's not expected to return until like 2036 and it's just going to look for stuff around Jupiter or whatever it is. And or I don't know if it's going to return, but it maybe won't get there until 2036. Anyway, so the reason we're talking about it is that they decided as an official mascot for this, they're actually using Sonic the Hedgehog and they've got Sega's consent to do it. So I'm not sure if this makes Sonic the first character to go into space or not. But uh, it's certainly a very unique title for uh, Sonic to have. Um, very cool, I think. So there's really no follow-up to that. Like it's again, it's like the, the the McDonald's Doom thing. It's just kind of an interesting little factoid, and I doubt it'll play any other significance. But it's cool. It's cool to think that because uh, Sonic's always been kind of like that, you know, in, in his heyday, and that's it. Kind of gives me nostalgic vibes for. Uh, the Sega of old, who uh, always found ways to put Sonic first into great stuff, like, you know, being a Macy's Day float parade type of thing, and um, he got his own Formula One car, and, like, he, Sonic had a really great history when Sega was at their peak, so while I've, I maintain that Sega's been doing a very good job of kind of steering back towards being what they once were, this kind of adds to that, is the point I'm making, because the Sega of old would have been the Sega that's like, let's put Sonic on a rocket and send him into space. You know what I mean? And the fact that they actually did that, I think, is really neat. Um, so that's cool. Doesn't have much of a point, but it's cool. It just kind of gives me like, oh, that's cool. Sega, Sega remembers. Sega remembers. Um, next up. Uh, this is and just a small thing again. It's something that's kind of driving me a little nuts because I'd like to get it, but it's probably going to be really hard to find, although I have not tried yet. Um, if you guys remember Ghostbusters, the 2009 video game, um, which in a sense was the real Ghostbusters 3, um, before the 2016 remake and now the upcoming 2020 uh, 3 remake. I don't know how you really call that. Um, but anyway, uh, that one actually had the entire cast in it. and It was a video game, sure, but it had a full like story and everything. That game uh, has been re-released on the Switch uh, in physical form, and they're calling it Ghostbusters Remastered, although I don't know how much better in terms of performance it actually is over the Xbox 360 and PS3 version. I, mean, I assume it has some advantages over it. Uh, the physical edition of that is exclusive to GameStop for some reason, um, which is cool, I guess. I mean, good for GameStop. They needed something to draw people in. The fact that it exists physically is nice. Although, when I say exclusive to GameStop, I mean within the United States. I have no idea how this applies to other countries and territories. But at least within the U.S., it's exclusively sold at GameStop physically. Um, I might have to try and go out and get that, just because that, that one's actually kind of a worthwhile pickup. Um, something about GameStop and Ghostbusters, man. I don't, I don't know how they, like, what deal they signed or what, but uh, the same thing actually happened, like, you know, they had this Ecto-1 Transformer that's in the design of, like, a Generation 1 Transformer toy exclusively sold at GameStop. Um, I, ne I couldn't find it for the longest time, and randomly I did on some trip out in California, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm getting that, and I'm bringing that back with me. They had a, a cool t-shirt of it, too, which I didn't get, although I regret the hell out of that, because it was a really neat shirt of the Ecto-1 transforming into the, the, the Autobot design that they had there, which I wish I had gotten. That was just a cool shirt. Uh, but yeah, something about Ghostbusters and GameStop, I don't, again, I don't know what deal was signed there, but it seems to carry on to this, or it's just a huge coincidence, I'm not sure, but still, uh, very cool that that game got remastered and re-released, although, again, I have no idea if it's available on Xbox One and PS4, I haven't heard anybody talk about that, so at the moment it seems to just be Switch, but, um, yeah, that's a thing. So, there you go. Uh, next up, I'm sure a lot of people are gonna ask, and unfortunately this is a super short one because I don't have much to say. The Joker movie. Um, I have not seen it yet, which tells you everything you need to know. But one thing that I have been hearing a lot about is people are saying that this movie is like phenomenal, that it could win Best Picture, etc. Uh, and that Robert Downey Jr., who might get snuffed for another Oscar due to The Joker once again. And for those who don't remember, back in 2008, he was up for an Oscar for um, Tropic Thunder. And he lost out to uh, Heath Ledger's performance in The Dark Knight. And now some people are saying that Robert Downey Jr. is going to lose, uh, even though there hasn't been much of an Oscar contention argument made for him for um, Endgame, uh, some people are saying that he might lose out again to, if he gets nominated, to um, uh, jo jo Joaquin Phoenix. I can never pronounce his first name. Um, for his performance as the Joker, which would be kind of amusing in a weird way. Um but that's beyond that, I don't have much to say. I do want to see it, I just haven't had the time to do so. So I'll get around to it when I get around to it. Um, but moving on, speaking of the uh, comic books and DC specifically and all that stuff, next thing that's going on that I find fascinating 
is so I do not follow much in the way of DC's like television shows, um, like the Supergirl show and all that stuff, Arrow, all that stuff. Um, but they are they have been doing this one lately, and I'm sure you guys have seen it all over your feeds because I have for sure about how they're basically doing the infinite crossover crisis um, or whatever it's called, the DC Infinite Universe Crisis storyline. And I find this actually fascinating because it's it's going to be a nostalgia trip, but they're basically using their show as a platform to have multiple versions of the same characters within the same show. So they're going to have Brandon Routh return as Superman and coexist with the Superman they already have. And then they're going to have Tom Welling come back, who played him in Smallville, uh, and he'll be Superman as well. So you'll have multiple Superman and multiple of other characters from other universes. I want to see that just because I think that'll be a cool postscript to, you know, Superman Returns, which we never really got, and a cool postscript to Smallville, which we kind of got because they had the Season 11 comics, but I never read those to keep it real with you. I think it would be cool if they did the Season 11 comics as, like, an animated movie. Um, I doubt they will, but that would be really neat. Um, maybe they will. Maybe this will be successful enough and create enough Smallville demand that they'll, you know, because Warner and Anim- Warner Brothers Animation has actually been really good with the whole DC stuff. So maybe they could do that. That'd be neat. But um, I'd like to see that. And the other thing that I find fascinating about it is people crap all over Superman Returns, and there's a lot of reasons to do so. I I can never sit here and tell you it was a good movie, but I will defend it on a couple of points. One, um. It needed to exist, and people don't really know that. There was a a legal reason that movie had to exist. If uh, you study the history of the Superman franchise, after Superman 4 fell apart, its rights ended up in the hands of a guy named John Peters. John Peters is best known for these Kevin Smith bits where you know he's talking about making Batman with him and ultimately making Superman with him. Um, John Peters was the guy who kind of kept Superman out of movie theaters for like the better part of 15 years. Uh, because he had these crazy ideas of what Superman should be, he shouldn't fly, he shouldn't have a suit, all this stuff. And until the the problem is he had rights to do, he was the owner of the rights of the movies. Kind of like Sony owns the Spider-Man movie rights, like this dude owned the, the Superman movie rights. But the way that contract worked is it really only worked as a one-time thing. Like as soon as they made a Superman movie he authorized, he would only he would no longer have full retaining control of the rights, he would just have part of it. So they had to make a movie to satisfy him to basically get the rights out of his hands. Superman Returns was that movie. And we should just consider ourselves lucky that they made as many positive changes that they did. Um, Another thing that people never really know about that movie is its existence unlocked the rights to another Superman movie. If you've ever heard of Superman 2, the Richard Donner cut, you have Superman Returns to thank for that movie. Uh, And the reason for that is... Another story. Superman's always got chaos in its productions, but uh, in the late 70s when they were making Superman 1 and 2, they were making them together at the same time Richard Donner was doing both. He ultimately finished Superman 1, but he only got about 80% of the way through Superman 2. They decided not to keep him for Superman 2 and then tossed him aside and said, we brought in this guy named Richard Lester and he's going to do Superman 2. So they had to, from uh, the rules of a director's guild and all that type of stuff, they had to throw out a large percentage of his footage so that Richard Lester could have a directing credit on the film. Thus, a large amount of the footage that Richard Donner shot was never used. Uh, and a lot of it was held up in rights issues, specifically everything with Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando shot a lot of footage for Superman 2 that they never used. Um, but Superman Returns wanted to use some of that unused footage for parts of Superman Returns. And by then, you know, it wasn't as big of a deal. Marlon Brando wasn't around anymore. His estate was very willing to cooperate because essentially to them it was free money. And so they basically bought out the rights to that footage. But by doing so for Superman Returns, they unlocked it for use for Superman 2, the Richard Donner cut. So Superman Returns had its reason to exist. It was the sacrificial lamb movie that allowed, ultimately, Superman 2, the Richard Donner cut to exist and for Man of Steel and all that stuff to come into existence. You had to make this movie to make the other movies come after it, uh, which is kind of a fascinating point. But... Not so much that I was a big fan of Superman Returns, but one must remember that Superman Returns exists within the actual continuity of the Christopher Reeve Superman movies. So he is essentially supposed to be that same Superman. So, okay, one can argue whether that's cool or not, but he is around and he is going to continue to play the character, which I think is fascinating. So when you watch this Infinite Crisis thing, 
as weird as this might sound, you are looking at the Christopher Reeves Superman in this universe. So you have the Tom Welling Superman and the Christopher Reeves Superman, even though the Christopher Reeves Superman is played by Brandon Routh. Do you understand? Like, I think that's... It's kind of fascinating. It'll be a nice postscript to both the Donner universe, if you want to call it that, and the um, the Smallville universe. Now, I'm wondering if they're going to have any other Superman cameos. Like, there's other people who have played Superman, uh, both animated and live action. I think the only other one you could get live action that would be kind of interesting to people would be, um, other than uh, you're not going to get uh, 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 why am I, uh, Henry Cavill. You're not going to get him. Not right now. But what you could get maybe is um, Dean Cain. He played Superman for four years on uh, Lo- The Adventures of Lois and Clark. Uh, I doubt it because they haven't mentioned him at all. And if he does come into that, it would be kind of fascinating to see that play out. But his version of Superman was always kind of campy and weird. And then I don't know how you do that without getting Terry Hatcher, which maybe you could do. But, um, yeah, they haven't mentioned it at all. And I think they're doing really well with the two that they've got. So I'm, I'm pretty interested to see in what that ultimately ends up being. Because the other thing you got to remember about it is this is like an episode of a TV show. This is not a movie or anything. Although with all the attention they put around it, you would think it was. Um, but how many episodes of random TV shows do you see that have this much buzz about them? So, and this, and this much buzz at the production point, we're not even at like the promotional marketing standpoint, we're at the production side of things. So it'll be cool because this will be, I don't know anything about that DC show that's actually in existence, but it will be the closer for two other Superman storylines, which is kind of fascinating to me that you can do that. Um, so good on them. I'm excited. And now, finally, speaking of weird deals and possibly closing things and all that stuff, we're going to talk about the Spider-Man deal because this has been updated. So, for those who don't know, uh, Spider-Man is uh, obviously a Marvel character and therefore the property of Disney. However, uh, they do not own the movie rights to the character. Sony does. They've owned him since the late 90s, I believe it is. And they have no interest in giving him back. <laughs> and why would they? So there's a long convoluted story behind this. But all you really need to know is that for Spider-Man to have appeared in the two uh, Homecoming and Far From Home movies, as well as uh, the three he did, the two Avengers plus Captain America Civil War, that those five-picture deal, Sony and Marvel had to come to a deal together. And they did, and that's why that happened. Now, the deal came to an end, and everybody just assumed naturally they were going to extend it. They did not, at least not initially. Uh, And so my previous podcast, I I talked about this for quite some time and how, frankly, irritated I was about the whole situation. Now, amusingly, the exact same day that my podcast went public, they also announced they had decided they had found a way to kind of temporarily extend the deal. And so I want to take some time to explore that, because what we now know is... Spider-Man will have another single standalone movie within the MCU, and he will be entitled to one additional appearance within whatever Marvel wants to do with him. So uh, let's. there's so much to break down here. First, uh, a lot of the story that's coming out is that Tom Holland, who plays Spider-Man, actually personally called up Bob Iger, the head of Disney, and said, like, you got to work this out. And if you've been following Tom Holland and the story around him, you can tell he's siding more with disney than he is with sony uh and you can see why uh because they've been handling the character really well and sony hasn't um so whatever either way they, they did come to an arrangement and the deal as we understand it is as follows financially speaking it's pretty much the same deal they had before um but we think and nobody knows for sure yet that the deal the concession that disney had to make was that um Sony has been trying to create this like Venom verse, like they're their own Spider-Man universe. I've been talking about this for a long time, an attempt to hijack the MCU, make their own Marvel movies and make you think that they're part of the MCU so that you go in and see them thinking they're part of that greater tapestry of story when they're not. Um, now, when it came to Venom, there's nothing Marvel could do to actually stop them from making it. So as we understand it now, Sony knew they couldn't put Spider-Man in that movie. They knew that. They, uh, they couldn't put Peter Parker, they couldn't put 
Spider-Man, but they could use any of the other characters they wanted to that they have the rights to, but none of the MCU characters. So if the report is true, what Sony tried to do was creatively and legally get around this by casting Tom Holland to just play a guy who was like walking around a store and then they just look at each other or something like that. They reportedly shot a scene like this. So the casual audience would look at it and be like, oh, there's Spider-Man, even though he's not Spider-Man. He's just some guy who is Tom Holland. That was the idea was to try and legitimize their own stuff. And Disney forced them to take that out through legal threats because it's like, no, you're just trying to get Spider-Man in there. This created tension. Assuming this is true, and I believe it is, um, we now are at a point where it seems like Disney might have caved on that side of things. They might start allowing Spider-Man to appear in the Venomverse movies, uh, which would be problematic. Um, I hope it's not true because I just, I just, I, I don't like the idea that this, this like leech can attach itself to the MCU and just make these screwed up decisions, uh, that makes the casual audience think that that's, you know, canon when it's really not. I really don't like that. Um, they also would not have access to other MCU characters and stuff. It would be just kind of, uh, it really is a goal to trick you as an audience member, which I really don't like that. Um, and it, it really upsets me. So that's part of it. The other part is uh, the reason I think Sony might've come back to the negotiating table is that they were getting the, the brunt of the blame for this whole situation. Um, because again, a lot of Tom Holland from example was not siding with them. He was saying like, Oh, we'll continue to make Spider-Man. Like, cause he has to, he's still contractually obligated to do another one, but it wouldn't be surprising if he said after that, he, he didn't want anything to do with it. And then once again, they'd have to reboot Spider-Man. Um, so they were getting a lot of public blame for this. I think that was a lot of the pressure. But then there was the whole story about Apple coming into play. Now, this kind of story kind of went and it came and went, but I still think it has some merit. So you need to understand something here. Sony has the rights to Spider-Man's characters for film purposes. However, that's only as long as they honor the deal that was originally signed, which means they have to produce a movie every so often, uh, and they, as long as they themselves retain the rights. Sony cannot sell the Spider-Man rights to anyone other than Marvel, which would be Disney. They're not allowed to like sell it to Warner Brothers and then Spider-Man starts appearing in like Superman movies. You can't do that. Um, if, if ownership of Sony Pictures changes, then the rights to Spider-Man revert back to Marvel for free with literally no cost. Not a dime, nothing. So here's the situation as we uh, can speculate based on what we know. Uh, Sony Pictures has not been doing that well for a long time. And Sony Corporate in Japan has been kind of pushing for the possibility of perhaps selling the film division. Now, if they sell the film division, Spider-Man goes to Disney for free regardless of who they sell it to. They could sell the entirety of the film division to Warner Brothers or Paramount or whoever, and it doesn't matter. Spider-Man is not part of that deal. He goes right back to Disney for free. That's a very important thing to understand. So Sony knows they have much less um, weight with the idea of selling their film division to anybody other than Disney. Because Disney's the only one who could look at it and go, we want all this because it will include Spider-Man. Um, so make sure you understand that. It basically ups the value of the sale substantially, but only to Disney. However, as Disney has been absorbing so many things lately, as recently as Fox as well, I don't think they're really interested in absorbing Sony for their entirety plus at that point you're getting to like while it's entertainment you are getting into legal territory where it might be considered too much of a monopoly for disney to have this many different film studios under its belt so that can create problems so it's unlikely that disney would buy out sony pictures wholesale the only other legitimate offer that anyone has kind of seen is from apple Yes, Apple. Now, the reason Apple is interested in possibly absorbing Sony Pictures is Apple is trying to create more content the same way Disney is uh, for its own streaming service. That's why Disney bought Fox, was to get all of their backlog to add to their own Disney Plus streaming service. Apple TV needs more stuff. And absorbing a pre-existing film studio with a giant catalog of things does make that more possible. But Apple's not stupid. They know Spider-Man can't be part of that deal. Disney knows Spider-Man can't be part of that deal. And Sony knows Spider-Man can't be part of that deal. So if if Sony is seriously intent on being bought out by, say, Apple, 
they have to cut a deal with Disney first. They have to go to and be like, well, you know what? We've kind of changed our minds. Maybe we'll sell you Spider-Man wholesale. No, no, no. We're still staying a film studio. We're going we're gonna to keep being a film studio. We just don't want to do Spider-Man anymore. So we'll t sell them to you for $10 billion. Does that sound good? Which was the actual number that was being thrown out there was that at one point, Sony was kind of considering selling Spider-Man off for $10 billion to Disney. If they did that, there is no reason at that point for Sony to stick around because then they've lost their biggest franchise left and they're just ready to be absorbed by Apple, which would be, that's what Sony's goal would be in this scenario is sell Spider-Man off separately to Disney, then get bought out by Apple because then they get the most money for them. Apple's ideal scenario is to just absorb uh, Sony Pictures knowing full well that they can undersell them by saying, look, your studio is worth X amount with Spider-Man. We can't have Spider-Man, so we can only offer you this, which would be much less than Sony would want for their uh, situation. And Disney's ideal scenario is to let Apple absorb Sony Pictures and then get Spider-Man back for free. Now, none of this can happen quickly. That's not how these things are done. So in the meantime, you do have to deal with the actual Spider-Man movie situation. Because um, if Sony doesn't deal with it quickly, they lose the rights to it anyway. Hence, they have to continue into production of something. So I think that's actually a large motivator to why they came up with this temporary deal, because it buys all parties more time to get the situation resolved in in this weird chess game, a three-way chess that they're all playing with each other. Um, in the meantime, you can have a Spider-Man movie that has a proper conclusion. That's the thing, is another people uh, that people don't know or maybe didn't think of, is at the end of Spider-Man uh, 2 or Far From Home, it ends on this ridiculous cliffhanger. But had Sony not renewed the deal, there's no way to resolve that cliffhanger because they're not allowed to use any of the MCU characters. Even like the spin-off characters, like their version of Aunt May cannot be used. Their version of MJ cannot be used. The only person who could be is Spider-Man himself, and he's not even allowed to wear the same costume. So it would have been really hard to, he would have, especially with such an insane, you know, cliffhanger, like the entire world knows my identity. He would have had to like wake up, you know, in another dimension somehow and be like, I don't know what happened. I woke up in another dimension. I guess here I have an entirely different looking family and nobody knows. Anyway, back to being Spider-Man. Like it would have had to be that level of stupid to have any sort of sense of uh, connectivity. Um, you know, so whatever. I think this was just done to buy all parties a couple more years to figure out what the next move is. And the only reason you're getting the uh, Spider-Man has to go into uh, a Disney movie, specifically probably the new Avengers, which they I think is called Damage Control, Avengers Damage Control. The only reason I, th I think that they did that is just kind of a quid pro quo thing because Disney's like, look, man, if we're going to help you make this movie and, you know, extend things, you got to do us a solid and you got to throw us back in appearance. So where they will use that appearance remains unknown. Uh, most people are suggesting that it will be um, Avengers Damage Control, which at the time I record this was announced like yesterday. Then there's been uh, ideas that he might get thrown into something like Captain Marvel to try and like boost you know captain marvel's kind of appeal but nobody really knows yet uh it would be interesting to see where he he may show up but if he shows up in uh phase four at all uh outside of his own movie i don't know but i i'm assuming it'll be damage control which is kind of an appropriate name considering that they're doing a lot of damage control over the spider-man deal so and the last subject here which is just a micro subject real quick here i just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody out there for listening this is actually my 10th anniversary of being on youtube technically i started the channel back in april of 2009 but the first video i ever put up was actually october of 2009 unfortunately that video no longer exists it was uh this power rangers dark knight like trailer i made you can find it on vimeo still um, but, uh, yeah, I had to take it down for like copyright bot reasons, whatever, but technically I've been making videos on this channel since 2009 and very appropriately, I, you know, and the whole time I've been doing it, many wonderful things have happened. So much awesome stuff. Um, but I never actually made a video that hit 1 million views and just somewhat appropriately, uh, I finally did, uh, my back to the future four, uh, movie made out of the back to the future game actually did reach 1 million views and it did so only a couple weeks ago like it's very late in September so it was like right there on the cusp of uh one time in 10 years I, I did that so I think that's really neat and uh yeah I'm basically just patting myself on the back sort of but no more accurately I'm thanking you guys for still being here I am uh I'm an old war dog of YouTube like I am a relic I have still I'm still around for some reason so it's awesome but you guys are are the ones who make that possible 
seriously with the patreon support I, I really do appreciate that and of course just watching and supporting the channel you guys are awesome so uh we'll wrap it up here i want to thank very much the all the patreon backers especially uh, so we'll give another round of shout outs here Corey marsh jesse perez jo joseph tamborino Luis bonilla michael kelly eric Perales, and trey wagner as well as the other patreon backers uh and everybody who just watches and has been supporting for the last 10 years it's it's absolutely awesome thank you so much and i'll see you all later Oh, if you could like, comment, subscribe, and all that stuff too, I'd really appreciate that. Now, thank you very much. I'll see you all later.